introduce um, our speakers for today. The first thing I wanted to do is introduce you to Jesse Crabtree. This is our new IT specialist over here in the Plant Science Building. So if you haven't uh, put a name to a face yet, he <laughs> is the new Jacob slash the new Matthew. Now he's Jesse. And so upstairs in the same office where those guys have always been located on the fourth floor here and jobs exactly the same as usual. So if you're having printer, computer, um, audiovisual issues in any of our rooms over here, um, and in KTRDC, um, Jesse's the guy. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Second quick announcement is um, Katie Pratt with AgCom is looking for news stories. So if anybody has uh, something that they think is newsworthy, if you could please direct it my way, I'll uh, send it up the chain. It is nice to have our faculty, staff, and students highlighted um, in her work. So if you have something, please let me know. And the last one is next week is the three minute thesis. Is that right, Rebecca? And it's at noon and it starts with lunch or no, it starts with talks. Okay, so full afternoon next week. Um, I hope you guys can join us for at least a bit of it. Um, lunch is sponsored, so at least come over and partake of that, but hopefully you can watch. Those are usually uh, pretty popular. Next Friday, Ray. Right? Yep, we moved it this year to try to accommodate our changes on the um, on the IPSS symposium that's happening too. Anything else that I'm missing from anyone? Okay, the dossiers are all in, people. <laughs> They're off my desk, yay! <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over to Ray. Here you go to introduce Papru for us. Thank you. It's my privilege to introduce the USDA PAPRU unit, the Forage Animal Livestock, let's see, Forage Animal Production Research Unit. I messed up the introduction already. Sorry, guys. Uh, but they're, um, I don't think about them in those, in those formal titles. I think about them as friends and colleagues and mentors. Um, we've got the, the four research scientists that are located at that unit, but there's a host of other people that are involved there. Um, so Isabel Kagan, Jimmy Klotz, Randy Dinkins, and Michael Fleif. And, and I thought about giving a detailed professional introduction, but you can look on their website and look at the 20 odd publications a year in refereed journals um, and see some of the details and they'll be giving you some of those details. Um, you know, they're nationally known as scientists and as professionals, but my main introduction is when I go out to um, extension meetings, and I'm talking to producers, and I often mention that we have a USDA research lab here on campus, and we're privileged to have that. And then I give insights of some of the things that are being found on a research standpoint that have direct application. You know, I talked about red clover just last night. Um, I talk about sugar concentration in forage grasses and the implications that'll have. I don't talk as much about some of your work, Randy, but I enjoy our conversations about um, alfalfa genetics, and it takes me back to my days as an alfalfa breeder. And Jimmy, I'm often showing um, a picture of cross-section of vessels and showing what basal constriction is really all about. So I really like not just that I can talk about that, but that you all have a priority, not just of doing top quality research, but of making sure that that's applicable and that's communicated. Um, Michael, I heard you present at one meeting, it may have been the Heart of America a few years ago, and you, you boiled it down into such a practical way. I said, wow, there's a top research scientist that's a better extension specialist than I am in explaining things. So, uh, privileged to introduce these guys and look forward to hearing their update of some of the work that they're doing. Okay, Jimmy. And we're gonna clip you on here with a, when your clip gets lost, then you use an alligator clip. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So let's see. Okay. So uh, my name is Jimmy Klotz. Uh, I am the sacrificial lamb, the first person up. So I was uh, tasked with giving a little bit of an overview on where we kind of fit in in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, here's a org chart it's a little it's a little dated 
Uh, if you've been watching the news, some things have been changing lately. But, uh, uh, we're part of the United States Department of Agriculture, so our, our main boss is the Secretary of Ag. We're part of the executive branch. Um, the Agricultural Research Service, which we work in, is the principal in-house research agency of the USDA. So there's research labs peppered across the country, ranging from small units or locations like ours to larger uh, centers that you know, house uh, larger numbers of scientists. Um, we're one of four uh, principal component agencies in the research, education, and economics mission area. Uh, we've been open since 2003 here on campus. Uh, the labs have been operational since 2004. Well, wrong way. Uh, and our mission, and many of you are, have heard this time and time again, but I think it's important to remind ourselves, and maybe there's people in the room. Uh, that aren't aware of us and, and could uh, learn a little bit about us through hearing this mission statement is to improve the productivity, profitability, competitiveness, and sustainability of forage-based enterprises within the East and Midwest transition zone of the United States through improved understanding of the fundamental biological processes that occur at the animal plant interface. Uh, sorry for the I'm still struggling with the pointer, but, uh, and this animal plant interface is really, uh, I think what makes us unique in our, in our research. Uh, our approach is multidisciplinary. And you'll see that uh, as you hear the other speakers get up today, we all uh, come from very different uh, academic backgrounds and our academic interests are very different. Uh, and we work together to identify evaluate and manipulate metabolic and physiological factors that influence food animal and equine health and productivity as well as plant persistence and productivity. And we are able to accomplish this primarily uh, through our strong collaboration with the UK faculty. Uh, we have uh, what was formerly called a specific collaborative, sp specific cooperative agreement. It's now the non-assistance cooperative agreement that allows us to uh, work closely with you guys and, and facilitate uh, research that goes back to that mission statement. And I think we're, FAPRU is a great example of how that can really work well, the federal government and the state government agencies working together. Um, we're, uh, like, as I said, co-located here on campus in Ag North. Uh, what's being increasingly referred to as the wet side of Ag North, which has to do with the recent floods, not so much as consumption. But uh, we have 5,000 square foot of lab, lab space. Uh, feel free to come by and visit anytime. Uh, we collaborate with not just faculty here in plant science, but animal science, ag engineering. Oh, what are some of the other departments that you collaborate with, Michael? Uh, I mean, uh, if anybody has a good idea, we're always willing to listen and collaborate. Um, we're also adjunct faculty members in animal and plant science departments as well. Uh, we have six scientist positions, two of which are currently vacant, and we're working to get those filled. Uh, we have five lab technicians, one postdoctoral research associate, a program support assistant, and an analytical chemist who's actually a UK employee, Dr. Jack Goodman. A uh, good guy to get to know. Uh, in terms of our research programs, I'm the, at present, the token uh, research animal scientist, and maybe that's why they made me go first here in the plant science seminar series. I don't know. But uh, we also have Dr. Michael Plyth, the ruminant microbiologist, and Dr. Isabel Kagan, a plant physiologist or psychologist, right? Okay. And Dr. Randy Dinkins, a plant molecular bio, uh, geneticist. So as you can see, we're uh, very multidisciplinary, but we all work together on a lot of the same problems. and. As an animal scientist, I continue to learn every day about plant science and things outside of my field. And so just as a, a biological scientist, I really have, have grown to appreciate that. And that wasn't something that when I originally took the job that I, I fully appreciated at the time. Um, my overarching research goal for my component is how to better define and determine the causative mechanisms by which urban alkaloids 
negatively affect livestock. On the off chance it, that there's somebody in this room that doesn't know what ergot alkaloids are, and hasn't heard the spiel about what fescue toxicosis is, I'll give you a quick background. I suppose there's always a chance, right? Um, so these are toxins produced by the endophytic epichloe fungus and tall fescue that discourage herbivory. So there's my play into the plant animal interface. And I say toxins specifically because there's more than one compound. Early in my uh, days here at Fat Fru, they were spent trying to determine which of these compounds are more biologically active than other compounds because we didn't really know which compound was responsible for causing these uh, problems, uh, which ones are or are not the causative agents. And working to define what is fescue toxicosis. Uh, I, uh, every day I, I wake up thinking about how I can improve that definition by some of the, some of the research that we do. Uh, traditionally, fescue toxicosis has been defined as a multifaceted syndrome that could uh, be thought of in terms of fescue foot, uh, very graphic images of hoof loss in, in animals that have consumed uh, toxic tall fescue that contains ergot alkaloids, uh, constriction of internal organs such as the kidney or the small intestine through fat necrosis, so you get hardened clumps of fat that cut off uh, the function of these internal organs. Obviously, these are severe scenarios that are uh, caused for animal welfare concerns, and a lot of times uh, result in the loss of the animal. This is a huge loss for the producer. It's something that uh, is very undesirable. Uh, there's also another, a third component, general toxicosis or summer slump, which is uh, much more prevalent than these extreme cases, but uh, less, uh, it results in less uh, loss in terms of the animal's life, but it still uh, results in loss of money. In terms of production. Uh, this is an animal obviously suffering uh, from extreme scenarios of heat stress, okay? So it's very shaggy hair coat. Uh, obviously it's spending a lot of time in the mud. Uh, these are external signs of a general fescue toxicosis or a steer suffering from fescue toxicosis. Rough hair coat, obvious increased sensitivity to heat stress. This animal's not eating, it's not gaining. Uh, in, in terms of cow-calf operations, we see decreased weaning rates as, as a consequence of decreased milk production, okay? Um, they don't always look that way. Sometimes externally, you have animals on fescue, then they, they seem okay. They're not, they don't look as bad as, as, as that guy. Uh, but internally, and we see this a lot in experimental scenarios, uh, they can suffer from vasoconstriction, decreased prolactin, increased body temps, and decreased rates of conception. So the producer could still be losing money, uh, even though the animals aren't shaggy and muddy. They, these animals might not be living up to their full genetic potential. Uh, a lot of these symptoms that I just rattled off are related to uh, aspects of vasoconstriction. So obviously, in those pictures with the Cow's hooves were falling off, our fescue foot, that's associated with a loss of peripheral tissues related to vasoconstriction. Uh, oftentimes that happens in the winter months and as a consequence of frostbite. Okay, so the blood flow to that extremity isn't adequate to keep it warm, and then you, then you get severe, severe cases such as that. Um, so a lot of these symptoms are related to poor peripheral circulation. We have a uh, constriction of the, the smooth muscle layer that makes up the blood vessel, and this results in a constriction in the lumen, so you're just not having adequate blood flow to the extremities in the body. Uh, the shaggy, muddy steer uh, can't dissipate body heat. A lot of times the blood vessels in the surface of the skin will vasodilate and allow body heat to dissipate. This can't happen if the blood vessel is in this constricted state as opposed to something that's more dilated, allowing more blood flow. So the majority of my work has gone into understanding how ergot alkaloids cause vasoconstriction, okay? And to do that, we use a piece of equipment called the multi-myograph, which I got pictured up there, and we couple that with vascular bioassays that we develop to study 
different toxin bioactivities in different vascular beds in, in multiple species, not just cattle. Um, bovine bioassays that we've de developed and validated to date are the lateral saphenous vein. And I don't know if you have really good eyesight, you can see it right there. There's like a little line in the animal's hind limb. Uh, that's been our main workhorse bioassay where we've defined a lot of what we know today about which um, toxins are bioactive. Uh, we also have a ruminal artery and vein bioassay and a mesenteric artery and vein bioassay where we can study uh, blood vessels that support the foregut and the midgut in terms of nutrient uptake. So if you have decreased blood flow to these digestive organs, does that hamper the animal's ability to absorb nutrients and, and grow? And lastly, the, mo the most recent one we've developed for cattle is the digital vein, which is really the same blood vessel as the lateral saphenous vein. It's just more uh, proximal to the hoof down here in the grass. And it's just like a Lexington Street. It's the same blood vessel, it just changes names as you go farther down the vein. So, <laughs> um, but these bioassays have allowed us to evaluate toxicity of various ergot alkaloids in different parts of the body. Not every vein. It's the same, it depends on where you take it from, as opposed, uh, it depends on where you take it from in relation to the function that it has. So a digestive vein is not gonna be the same as a vein from the plant. Uh, but, but these bioassays have allowed us to, for example, evaluate the recovery time of exposed livestock after withdrawal from a toxic pasture. How long does it take for the, the blood flow to return to non-toxic control or normal level? as well as understanding how ergot alkaloids interact with biogenic amine receptors to cause vasoconstriction. Um, it's been, as a scientist, uh, fascinating and frustrating. Uh, the ergot alkaloids, the tetracyclic moiety of this structure here is similar to serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine structures, which are outlined in bold here. And that's what allows them to cause these diverse array of symptoms. In, in, in affected livestock. Um, an example of how we study this with the myograph and the vascular bioassays is we're interested in serotonin receptor subtype 2A. This receptor is involved in the control of vascular smooth muscle contraction. And so in this case, we took ruminal arteries uh, and exposed them to different concentrations of herbal valine, uh, one of the prevalently produced uh, ergot alkaloids in soft fescue, for two hours. Um, after the exposure, we conducted a dose response on the myograph uh, using an agonist that's selective for this serotonin receptor subtype 2A, uh, TCB2. So on this data that I've got presented here, we've got the blood vessels percent response on the y-axis and the concentration of the selective agonist on the x-axis. So you can see the response in green for the blood vessels that were exposed to zero ergovaline. Uh, in blue, the blood vessels response that was exposed to 0.01 molar micromolar ergovalin and then one micromolar ergovalin exposed ruminal arteries in red. So you can see the response decreased with the 0.01 micromolar and was virtually abolished in the uh, one micromolar. So imagine if these blood vessels were in the in the living animal. These blood vessels are responding less than the controls and these blood vessels aren't responding at all to the ligand that's supposed to initiate that receptor and cause the vascular response. So the function of this receptor is completely disrupted. So that blood vessel is kind of in a static state at this point. The, it can't respond to the external, external stimuli that it's designed to respond to. Uh, and this, this is where we're spending a lot of our time right now is trying to understand how the ergot alkaloids cause this after a very short term albeit acute exposure. Uh, we see this same type of response when we biopsy blood vessels from cattle that have been grazing endophyte-free versus endophyte-infected tall fescue. The blood vessels from the endophyte-infected animals respond much less than the endophyte-free uh, treated blood vessels. And so this is, this is where we're trying to further clarify the definition of what is fescue toxicosis, at least in cattle. Uh, I say at least in cattle, we don't solely focus on, on cattle. That is my, my main uh, model. 
but I've worked with uh, Dr. Kara McDowell over in Vet Sciences, and she and I have worked up and developed a uterine and palmar artery and vein bioassay that complements her ultrasound work. And we've uh, profiled the vasoactivity of several different urban alkaloids, as well as some of the serotonin receptors that they're involved with in, in these equine blood vessels. Uh, additionally, I'm working uh, currently with Dr. Susan Duckett using a sheet model, looking at uh, uterine artery and umbilical artery and vein to study how these uh, toxins negatively affect animals during gestation using a, using a sheet model and, and how that causes intrauterine growth restriction. So what we're finding out is that the decrease in productivity starts really in utero if the dam is grazing the toxins during gestation. Uh, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of my research program. Uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for having us, and I would like to apologize in advance. Uh, I have to take off. I won't be able to stick around for questions. My wife and I are getting ready to go close on a house here in 30 minutes. And so uh, Dr. Michael Flight is our resident ruminant microbiologist, and he's going to be talking to you next about some of what he's interested in in his research program. Uh, he's... Also, I've just learned, been offered the job as research leader for the Forge Animal Production Research Unit, and I'll let him tell you if he's accepted, and he should be able to answer any questions you have for me. So. <laughs> Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you. All right. How does this thing work? There we go. So I'm happy to uh, have a chance to talk to you about what the microbiology lab at FAPRU is doing. Um, and uh, uh, we always have a, a number of projects going on. I like to collaborate. Anybody that wants to do anything related to microbes and you think that we can help you, please come on over and I'd at least like to talk to you about it. Glad to. Um, uh, but uh, one of our main focuses is uh, ice flagons from red clover. And this didn't really start as a fescue project. I'm going to show you this slide and tell you how it started. Um, but it's ended up being a fescue project. And I guess in Kentucky, you know, whichever way you go, you're going to end up back in our predominant forage grass. And, um, um, and then so in the end, we do have some fescue stuff and ends up very related to what Jimmy was just talking about. But it, um, it, it isn't where we started. Um, uh, Jimmy said that uh, when he... Uh, you know, wakes up in the morning, he's, he's thinking about how fescue toxicosis works. That's how he wakes up. When I go to bed at night, what keeps me from going to sleep is I'm wondering about where the nitrogen is going. I worry about nitrogen. And I think that's something that a lot of us here in the room can probably relate to. Um, uh, this is my kind of like my nexus slide, I guess you'd call it. And, 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 and I think as we walk through it, you know, you, whether you're working uh, on uh, pasture legumes or whether you're working in row crops and no-till, uh, you know, and whether you're working on environmental impacts um, um, or, or in animals. I think it's something we, many of us work on aspects of this problem here. And so the idea here is, you know, most of our nitrogen, of course, comes out of the Haber process. Um, um, and, uh, you know, here I've, you know, got that fertilizer going on to pasture grass. Um, although that's not necessarily true, of course, it's going to be used in row crops too. Um, but you also want to fertilize your hay fields. That's an important thing. Um, but uh, through, uh, um, uh, you, whether you're feeding a stored forage or whether you're grazing, the idea is to get that plant protein into animal protein and get the animal protein into the human food supply. And of course, there's inefficiencies everywhere along the way. Uh, you know, nitrous oxide production or uh, nitrification, you, know, you can lose nitrogen. Um, uh, you can lose uh, um, uh, nitrogen uh, from the animal through some other process that I'll talk about. There's inefficiencies uh, in, in the rumen and you can lose as much as half of your nitrogen going through there. Um, and of course, you can lose uh, carbon out of the animal too. Um, you can lose CO2 and, and, and methane and our industries uh, uh, get a lot of uh, criticism for contributing uh, to methane and uh, it's something I think we ought to have a greater discussion about. I don't think those criticisms are, are fair because that's new carbon that's in there. That's not ancient carbon that's being released. But nonetheless, it is a greenhouse gas. 
Um, and so, of course, your, you know, your nitrate and uh, your um, uh, uh, urea there can end up back in the water. It ends up being a source of groundwater contamination if it's not captured in your system. Uh, and uh, those gases, of course, are going to go into the atmosphere with their, with their greenhouse gases. Uh, not to mention that the uh, um, natural gas, the methane that was used in the hopper process to begin with, uh, is, is a fossil fuel. Um, so, uh, um, there, like I said, there's many places where many of us work here. If you're working on no-till or whether you're working on fertilization practices, um, uh, well, we all fit into this. And one place where uh, a rumen microbiologist like me fits into it is through antibiotic growth promoters and we can increase nitrogen efficiency that way. Um, uh, but there's a problem there too in that it's antibiotic resistance. And so this ends up being something like if you want a nexus statement for a grant, this ends up being you know, your nexus of, of uh, energy and climate change and, and water quality and food security and food safety and public health. And so there's a lot of things that come into this nitrogen problem right here. So the way antibiotic growth promoters work uh, is working on a particular group of bacteria right here. And I will try to use this pointer. The responsiveness is a little bit different than a laser pointer, isn't it? Um, uh, so if you um, uh, think of plant protein coming into the rumen of a ruminant right here, you have plant protein, um, and uh, uh, that animal can use that protein if it gets through, if, if, if it can escape the rumen, if it can es escape that first step in digestion, uh, the animal is going to be able to absorb that protein and use it. Um, but the bacteria get to act on it first, bacteria and the protozoa, and it can be broken down into peptides and amino acids, um, uh, and then can be uh, fermented into ammonia. And some of that ammonia can be recaptured as microbial protein, but a lot of it's going to end up in the blood. It's going to end up converted into uh, uh, urea, and it's going to be urinated out on the ground, which isn't such a bad thing if you're on pasture, because your plants, you know, might be able to capture it again. Um, but uh, in concentrated operations, you know, you lose a lot of nitrogen that way, and it becomes a big water quality problem. And so the antimicrobial feed additives like rumensin or like lasalicid, Thailand, some of the other things we use can act on this step right here, number three that's circled in green. So the deamination step is we can selectively kill those bacteria. And when you do it, you will decrease the amount of nitrogen that's coming out of the animal. Um, and even if you don't, you can get some efficiency because it can oxidize those amino acids for energy. Um, uh, but either way, you'll increase the feed efficiency and, and average daily gain of those animals if they're growing animals you can um, improve uh, um, milk protein and milk fat if uh, they're dairy animals. So um, even though we have good reasons to use an antibiotic growth promoters, they do cause, um, have been attributed to uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. And so we look for alternatives. And so that was the impetus, impetus for getting into this clover work. Um, and uh, Isabel, uh, Dr. Kagan was already working on clover. And so she was working with Dr. Norm Taylor in your department, uh, our, our late clover breeder. Um, and he was working on a clover browning project, um, uh, 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 clover uh, cures to a, to a dark color in hay. And he, so he was selecting for varieties that would cure green. Um, and Dr. Kagan was working with him on characterizing the compounds that were coming out of his clover. And, uh, and so I approached her and said, since you're making plant extracts anyway, I'm looking for antimicrobial plant compounds. Let's, let's look for some. And she agreed to work with me. And, uh, and so this is where we discovered uh, the antimicrobial activity of isoflavones and clover was through this type of assay right here. And so she made that thin layer chromatogram right here. And you, know, you can spot it with her sample, which would, uh, as uh, she develops it, it's gonna wick up that plate and the chemicals separate out. And so here are two of her standards. These are isoflavone standards right here. And then I could take those TLCs from her and I could overlay them with agar that's uh, seeded with one of those rumen bacteria that, could, that converts feed amino acids into into ammonia. And this is actually a reverse image right here. So when you see these dark spots right here, you're actually looking at zones of inhibition where the bacteria can't grow. And so that's how we, that's how we got into this kind of work. And so this is a figure that she made for our first paper. We published paper in 10, uh, 2010. So we were working on it in 2009. Uh, um, uh, so we're about a decade into this work, and most of that has been laboratory work that, that she and I have done and some others have helped us with. Um, uh, but really, just in the last few years, we've gotten into the field phase of that work. Um, but there's the basic structure of an isoflavone, if you'd like to see it, and, and uh, one of her chromatograms from that paper that we published.
So uh, it, just to summarize some of the work that we've done uh, uh, over the last few years uh, on that. So uh, first we learned that we can uh, inhibit these hyperammonia producing bacteria in pure cultures in vitro. Um, and uh, then we could do ex vivo experiments, which are experiments without culture, but basically simulating what happens in the animal without, without involving animals. Um, and uh, we can re reduce um, the number of, of uh, uh, hyperammonia producing bacteria. So we're killing the bacteria and reducing their activities. Um, and uh, more recently, we've had some colleagues at the University of Tennessee pick up on this work um, and are able to replicate it using completely different methods. And that's always really nice to see that other people can get the results that you got um, using a different method. Um, and more importantly, um, we did uh, in 2016, summer of 2016, we took this to the field with the help of uh, Dr. Glenn Aiken, our last research leader. And, uh, and tested it in the field. And so these are the results of uh, uh, a, a supplemented pasture experiment that kind of shows that it works. And so we have a control here. These animals were only on pasture and this is their average daily gain right here. Um, and uh, then we gave them purified biocannon A. So this is really uh, still research. It isn't farming by any stretch of the imagination because that was an expensive experiment. Uh, purified biocannon A. And because it's just a white powder that came out of a bottle, you got to have a carrier for it. And so we use dry distillers grains. And so we have a control for our dry distillers grains, which makes a nice uh, uh, carrier. It also makes a nice protein supplement in these type of experiments because um, a lot of our protein supplements are going to come from legumes and they're going to have other isoflavones in them. So it worked. That's the point of that. Uh, and since then, we've gotten into some effects on carbohydrate use, utilizing bacteria, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really been nice, um, um, uh, uh, amazing, really. One of the problems you get into with feedlot antibiotics is they work really well in feedlots where you're feeding a bunch of cereal grain where most of the calories come from starch. But then when you're on pasture, you're feeding hay, it doesn't work because you're killing the bacteria that enabled them to utilize cellulose. The animals um, aren't able to do that. Mammals don't make enzymes to digest cellulose like they do starch. And so... We've done some of that, um, uh, uh, quite a bit of it in, in vitro. And, uh, and, and finally, this summer, uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Br Brittany Harlow, has uh, gotten the evidence that it happens in the animals too. So what happens to the isoflavones uh, after the rumen? And this is where it ties back into fescue toxicosis. Um, so they're metabolized by the rumen bacteria. You can imagine um, that if, uh, uh, you encounter a, a toxicant in your environment, there's uh, a good reason to transform it into something else. In this case, uh, uh, these steps uh, make it more soluble. Um, and so in the, in the rumen of ruminants or in the, uh, in the, in the, in the gut, uh, hind gut of non-ruminants, like some humans can do it and some humans can't, they do transform these isoflavones into isoflavone metabolites that are generally more soluble so that the host can carry them away. And so they can get absorbed into the blood. My host can get rid of my, my, my toxins for me. Um, the teleology there from the perspective of the bacteria. Uh, and uh, so they're absorbed by the host and they're detected in the blood, detected in the milk. Uh, they are estrogenic, mildly estrogenic, um, and uh, they're renally cleared. And the interesting thing was is that they're, they're, they're vasorelaxants. And so that's been shown in humans. And so we ran into this just in, in the general literature search as we were doing other isoflavone work. Um, and because they're vasorelaxants, they work in an opposite way as the vasoconstrictions that, uh, that, that Jimmy, that Dr. Klotz was talking about a minute ago. Um, uh, and uh, so we tested that, the idea that we might be able to reverse fescue toxicosis with these isoflavones. And uh, so I, I've shown these, these data a lot and I promise I won't show you all the slides. I know, I know that most of you have seen these probably already, but this is a Doppler ultrasound image of a carotid artery of a goat that's in, in vasoconstriction. And so, um, you're looking at the, uh, the, the the area of that artery. And uh, so it's similar to the experiments that, uh, that Jimmy showed you on his myograph where he had a, a, a donut of blood vessel cut out and he had it basically hooked in the caliper of that myograph. Only this is done with the ultrasound image, but you're still looking through that hole. You're looking through the lumen as though you were looking down a pipe, down the lumen of a pipe. And that's what that animal looked like in vasoconstriction. And so we had given it a bunch of uh, toxic tall fescue seed to make it vasoconstrict. And... Um, uh, when we add uh, isoflavones to it, you get the production of nitric oxide synthase uh, in, the, uh, in the vascular tissue, and you get vasorelaxation. So that animal is still getting just as much uh, toxic tall fescue seed as, as this other animal over here. 
uh, only it's completely opened up. Indeed, some of the, the goats end up above, above their baseline. They actually end up dilated, not just relaxed. And so we think that that uh, explains some of those old observations that people have always had that animals on toxic tall fescue pastures just perform better uh, when there's some clover in the pasture. And so this is how those experiments are done. I thought I'd show you some of the team, uh, uh, Brittany and Emily and, and, and Tracy, who, who many of you know. Uh, the steer's named James Sullivan. I'm not sure why the steer was named James Sullivan. That, that name didn't come from me. I don't know why, but I'm told that's what his name was, so I included him on the slide too. And, uh, and so you can see that uh, uh, Brittany's operating the computer right here. She's taking the image uh, of those. And Tracy's back here. He's holding, in this case, since this isn't a goat, this is a steer, we do the caudal artery. And so he's holding the ultrasound probe uh, right back there on the tail so he can get the uh, caudal artery. And this is why they don't let me do that is because uh, sometimes the steers just object to me and they you know, let it be known somehow. You think that you know, if you're shoving a steer into a chute, there's only one, he's only got two options. Either he's not gonna go or he's gonna go, but he has a third option and he can retaliate in, in the case of that's what that steer did right there. And then we still had to do the microbiology, so I'm back in the lab. Um, so uh, what we're working on now, that's kind of the history of that project and what we're working on now with isoflavones uh, we have a lot of help doing it, which is really great. Um, uh, we're working on uh, uh, delivering uh, isoflavones and supplemental hay. The answer to that is, is, is yes. And, and so uh, we have a paper that will be coming out in PLOS One soon. It's in review in PLOS One. And we're all real optimistic about it that, that shows hay supplementation. Uh, can we deliver isoflavones in mineral supplement to mitigate fescue toxicosis? Uh, yeah, the answer looks like yes. We have two different doses of isoflavones. Um, one is, is effective to promote growth in the way that antibiotic growth promoters do. And the other one uh, is effective at relieving fescue toxicosis. And it's amazing how little they actually have to get to open them back up. Um, and so we're able to deliver that in, in, in mineral for you know, producers who are interested in mineral instead of growing, growing clover, getting around problems like bloat that you have with clover. Um, do isoflavones reduce antibiotic resistant bacteria in ruminants? Um, uh, we are working on that now, too. Um, uh, we actually got ahead of ourselves and went ahead and did the feeding trial. The answer looks like that's going to be yes, that we can pretty dramatically reduce the number of tetracycline utilizing bacteria, or tetracycline uh, um, resistant bacteria, rather. Uh, and we're looking at interactions between isoflavones and forage quality. And so if you can get better weight gain uh, off of uh, a an animal when they're receiving isoflavones, can you make up for having a poor quality, like a more mature pasture or, or a, a more mature hay? Um, and Dr. Jack Goodman is helping us with, uh, um, with uh, determining uh, isoflavone metabolites uh, in animal matrices so that we can do some more interesting experiments. Among those are some that we're doing with sheep now. So Dr. Don Ely in the Department of uh, Animal Science is helping us with some sheep experiments. There's uh, uh, Don and, and, and Matthew there with the lamb, and Don's about to do a throat tube that one so that we can count bacteria. We're looking at hypermonia producing bacteria in his sheep. And the graduate student on that project is, uh, is Leah, Dr. Ely's graduate student. And she's working with uh, Elena, who you know, Dr. McCulley's graduate student in your department. Um, and uh, this is uh, a great collaboration. Um, uh, I'm, I'm real, real happy about it that it's happening, that uh, we're able to collect these data to have an ongoing animal experiment. And Elena is able to uh, collect uh, urine and look at uh, effects of uh, soil, uh, look at effects of both the uh, soil microorganisms on gas production and things like that from these lambs, from samples from real animals. And she's doing that in vitro but really great experiments. That's her urine cup right there. Uh, additionally, we're looking at uh, the stability of isoflavones under stored conditions. So the question would be, uh, you know, if you have hay or if you have uh, isoflavones in mineral, uh, are they stable? How long can you store that hay? What kind of storage conditions will uh, affect isoflavones in there? And Dr. Sue Noakes and her student, Rilwan, her PhD student, are help helping us with that. Additionally, Real One's got some uh, interesting ideas about how to, uh, other ways to deliver isoflavones too. I won't, um, uh, that's all I'll say about that. If Real One were here, he, could, he, he, he might tell you more, but that's all I'll say about that. But uh, we're, ha we're happy to be working with him too. Um, additionally, we do other things. We have other projects going on in the microbiology lab all the time. Uh, uh, we do some equine microbiology and, and we help some people across campus in the med center and in chemistry. 
with uh, uh, human microbiology projects. And uh, previously, we saw, we've helped Dr. Mark Coyne with uh, soil microbiology projects. We're interested in all those kinds of things and be glad to talk to you about any of it. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Kagan, our uh, plant physiologist, who is going to talk about some of her work with fructans and cool season gra grasses and some of her work with Rhizoctonia, right? Yes. No, I'm sure you would have seen it. Thank you, Michael. All right, so this goes in pocket. Yes. All right, and um, let's see. Oops, is it necessary? No, does it, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, All right. I think that'll stay if it falls off. This winter's not very responsive. It's got a little bit of a delay. Okay, let's see. Oh, I see. Wow. All righty. And um, hang on. The, let's see. All right. So am I, I'm on the correct slide. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little first about quantification of fructans in cool season grasses. And our interest in that lies in their purported role in pasture-associated laminitis of horses and ponies. So basically, the, um, the model based on feeding trials with, um, with commercially available fructans from chicory so it is a model there. Um, the chicory fructans are structurally somewhat different from some of the fructans in cool season grasses and similar to others. Is that they get, if you supply the horse with a large dose of fructans, they'll get fermented by the hindgut bacteria. Some of those bacteria will feel like they're at an all you can eat buffet, and you'll have a change in the relative abundances of different genera of bacteria in the hindgut. And some of the bacteria that are going to grow faster are going to produce a lot of lactic acid. And as a result, the pH goes down. Some bacteria lice because they can't handle such low pH. There will be endotoxins released. And all of these responses lead to inflammation, which in turn leads to degradation of the lamina holding the hoof to the coffin bone of, of the leg. And that is what leads to laminitis. And that's the best I can explain it from the standpoint of a plant psychologist. And so one of the questions about um, understanding the role of fructan and pasture-associated laminitis is whether the amount of fructan is a concern. If it is, you need to be able to quantify the fructan. The model is that um, you can, if you take the water-soluble carbohydrate, which is generally said to consist of mono and disaccharides and fructans, and you subtract the ethanol-soluble carbohydrate, um, you will be left with fructan because the general assumption is you don't have much um, or any fructan dissolving in ethanol. And so if you get a measure of the water and ethanol soluble carbohydrates at a forage testing lab, you can subtract the one from the other and get an idea of how much fructan you have. Um, so we, with the Ray Smith and Lori Lawrence and Kelly Prince, a graduate student, um, we looked at some fructans of a few different cool season grasses. And um, you can see in this case that if you, um, let's see if I can do this. If you look at the fructans out here for blue, for orchard grass, sorry, um, you have a whole lot of little peaks here going all the way out to, if you, um, if you count them, you have about 67 of these fructan peaks that can be distinguished from the, um, the mono and disaccharides over here. And in the ethanol extract, 
you only have chain lengths of about a, that are about 11 fructan units. So those are fructose units. Basically, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using fructan a little too uh, familiarly. A fructan is just a polymer, a, a number of fructose units put together with a, usually with a glucose at one end. So you can see quite a difference between the water and the ethanol soluble carbohydrates. If you subtracted this chromatogram from that one, you would be left with quite a bit of fructan. But now if you go to this tall fescue um, example, here is your water extract and you have fructans with that are about 25 fructose units long. And with the ethanol extract, they're about 13 fructose units long. And you can see if you subtract the one from the other, you really don't have much left over because <coughs> in the tall fescue, a lot of the fructan is this short chain fructan. So if you subtracted one from this one from that one, you would get the idea that you really had very little fructan left over when actually you have quite a lot that's accounted for in the ethanol soluble carbohydrates. So um, when you use, when you try to subtract your ethanol from your water soluble carbohydrates, your accuracy is going to be variable because um, you've got short chain fructans that are ethanol soluble. And so the cool season grasses, if they contain mostly short chain fructans, you're going to have a very similar profile, very similar amounts between your water and your ethanol extracts. And so now this is um, a little um, side project I'm working on, getting back into plant pathology, which is what my PhD was in. And let me see if I can get this video to work. Um, where would I click on, is there a, um, is there something I can click on here? I'm looking for a mouse. Yeah, Sorry, Rebecca. Right here. <coughs> oh, okay. So let's see, does it show up? Yep. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Yep. So this is, um, what you, some of you have probably seen this in horses. This is courtesy of Dr. Goodman and Dr. Goodman's horse. Um, and so you can see just a lot of drooling. And that happens when they either graze on pasture infected with um, Slafractonia legumenicola or feed on hay that's been infected by it. And so the pathogen, Slafractonia legumenicola is, um, the it causes a disease that's referred to as black patch. The pathogen used to be referred to as Rhizoctonia legumenicola. Um, it was a, classified as a basidiomycete. There was sequencing work done a few years ago that determined that it was actually an ascomycete, and so it was renamed that word, that root slafra, I've read comes from an old Norse word meaning to slobber. And the slobbering is due to an alkaloid. It's um, an indolizidine alkaloid instead of an ergot alkaloid. It is called slaframine. And so basically the fungus is producing this alkaloid. The, the livestock graze on the, the legumes. It's a legume pathogen. And um, they they start to salivate excessively. So basically, if you, you have to have clover that's susceptible to this fungus in order for the fungus to be able to spread and for that concentration of ergot alkaloids to build up to the point where this happens. And so I'm interested in finding out if we can if I can do some pathogenicity tests on different cultivars of clover and find some that are resistant to black patch. So um, with, I, I talked to Paul Vincelli about this and he recommended that I develop a PCR method to be able to readily identify the fungus in infected legumes. And so um, Randy Dinkins helped me with that and um, here you have 
Um, I, you have clover that I mock inoculated. The, the inoculated clover, I just took detached leaves and inoculated each leaf with a little plug of fungus growing off of a petri plate. And um, it's a little hard to see here, but if you go back up one slide, you can see this black lesion um, or dark brown lesion that's spreading all around a plug of clover. So that's what you get when, as a plant pathologist would say, that's good disease. And so here I, with the control clover and the inoculated clover, I um, extracted DNA and I did some, did a PCR reaction, seeing if I could amplify the clover DNA with um, primers to the isoflavone synthase gene to know that I had intact DNA. And then I also um, did some, some PCR reactions with primers that Randy helped me design to um, Slafractonia leguminicola. And you can see that um, I was able to pick up the, the fungus in the inoculated clover and in a culture of Slafractonia leguminicola. And so the method does work. And so now what I'm trying to do is to inoculate um, clover and then to be able hopefully to confirm that I've got the pathogen I want in DNA extracts of the clover leaves. Now, um, as far as looking for disease symptoms, I've run into trouble with that. Um, it's not as easy as it was for me to inoculate a Arabidopsis with Alternaria brassicola. And so I have inoculated, I've looked for disease symptoms, Basically, I get a few wimpy lesions that would not qualify as disease. And this is the same cultivar of clover that had those big brown lesions that you saw a couple of slides earlier. So stay tuned. I still have to perfect some aspects of the plant pathology. And with that, I'll hand it over to Randy. All right, here's this, here is this. So we're on? Yeah. So I'm just gonna give a kind of a quick overview and I thought I would give uh, all the people that are involved now, just at the end, because we're kind of starting to run. Uh, so, Working on again with uh, other folks in the lab on the red clover aspect as well. And I'll talk about that first and then come back and um, finish up with the work on uh, how best we, since that's been kind of our mainstay at the unit. So, the people that have been helping out in the clover part uh, Dr. Mike Barrett, our student Lucas Araujo, and Linda Williams from 24D Project, which we want to talk about today. Uh, Dr. Art Hunt and Manohar with some of the sequencing. Dr. Hun and Zhu, Joshua Singleton, who's a, a starting student, Julie Hancock, an undergraduate, and Beth David McNair uh, with his lab uh, working on some of the modulation. Dr. Nevin Young and Diana Trujillo in Minnesota as well, on, also on the modulation part. And he's Cliff Friday at ARS in Madison, Wisconsin, with some wine. And then on the health rescue part, Dr. Chris Shardle and Padma uh, in plant pathology, uh, Tim Phillips and Dr. Rebecca McCulley and Jim, Elizabeth, Marie, and Lindsay in the lab, uh, and Billy helped out in the field, uh, Michelle Graham and David Boyce in the ARS in terms of the sequencing, uh, Carolyn Young and Chuck West also with uh, some of the projects that were worked on in the, uh, on the health rescue part in the sequencing and looking at genome expression. So I'll just start off on the red clover, again, getting into the nodulation. Michael's already talked about the nitrogen cycle and we're interested in that in terms of looking at red clover. Um, so part of you looking at that is both from the isoflavone as well as the genes that are involved in nodulation. 
isoflavones are some of the first molecules that these guys recognize in order for it to form an attachment. Um, but it's also because Dr. Flyth is also looking at the biocannon A, and so we're trying to knock out the isoflavone synthase. Oops, wrong way. <coughs> so I won't go into the whole, you know, the nodulation, um, but one of the things that we've done is looked at GR, uh, plants that are nodulating versus those that aren't nodulating, looking for differential expression in total genes. And so we found that in the and those that were not nodulating, in other words, we did not um, infect with the uh, rhizobium. We had 343 genes that were overexpressed in the nod minus plants compared to the nod plus plants. And conversely, we had uh, 900 or so genes that were overexpressed in the nod plus compared to the nod minus. And a bunch of these are what's called NCR or nodule specific cysteine rich peptides. Uh, or nodule-specific PLAPs, it stands for polycysteine, um, hypoxygenase, and alpha toxin domain type proteins. So these are all small peptides that are targeted to bacteria that are involved in specificity of nodulation of these types of ligands. So red clover happens to have a whole bunch of these, and these are not found in, other, in many of the other ligands like soybeans. Eddie uh, Cago has a bunch of them, and um, so does red clover. Red clover has about 10 or 12 of these guys, the NPDs, or nodule specific PLAS proteins, and it has the highest number so far found in any ligand. What are these genes doing? We have no idea. So that's the question. So there's 400 or so that were, again, overexpressed in the uh, nod plus compared to the nod minus is part of this 900 or so. So we're trying to figure out what are these genes doing in red clover. <clears throat> so again, this just shows some of the sequencing that we've done. Each of these lines is a read from what's called RNA-seq, uh, which is basically a 100 uh, base read, and there's several million in a, in a run. And so this top lane is a nod plus plant, this blank lane here is a nod minus lane, and this is other, another nod plus lane. But you can see that this gene is very highly expressed in the nod plus plants, but not at all in the nod minus. This is for one of the uh, cysteine rich uh, peptides. Again, these are small proteins, about 60 to 100 amino acids. And obviously, as the name implied, they're cysteine rich. And many of them are toxic basically to different bacteria. And that's why they're so important in terms of the rhizobial uh, infection process. This is the same thing, just again, for the NPDs. Again, red clover happens to have a bunch of these compared to other legumes. And just showing the expression in the nod plus. There's some expression here in this one in the nod minus, very little in this one. Again, high expression in the nod plus. Uh, so this is two of them happen to be side by side in the in the genome. Uh, so this is just a annotation of the red clover genome where I map the reads to these genes, and just shows a differential expression. And so we're interested in exploring to see what these guys do. The other thing that we're interested in doing is knocking these guys out. Um, so using the CRISPR-Cas, uh, so we're all trying to knock out the isoflavone synthase, again, to collaborate with uh, Dr. Flight and uh, Dr. Kagan to see where this goes, as well as some other different genes that are specific to uh, the symbiosis, one is called RSD, or Regulator of Symbiosome Development. It's a C2, H2 zinc finger protein, and there's a number of other ones uh, this one here has been characterized in Medicago. There's some other ones that are tend to be uh, differentially expressed in um, red clover. We have no idea what they do, so we're going to try to knock them out to see what they are doing. So we do have one knockout so far, or knockdown as I call it, because unfortunately 
when we knocked it out, this was work done in Dr. Hunyan Zhu's lab, it knocked out nine bases. So it's still in train. It's lost three amino acids in this part of the protein. But it has knocked down when we look at the isoflavone concentration. This is just the pathway. And here's where isoflavone synthase is um, the enzyme is in terms of the pathway. Again, Dr. Flyer thought talks about biocannonary, pulmonary, diazin, and genstein. When we look at the wild type um, tissue, biocannonary, which is Dr. Jack Goodman who did the analysis, we see 24, what was this, 24,000? I can't remember. Per gram. per milligrams per gram compared to basically a tenfold reduction in the knockout that had with the homozygous, we had to cross these plants to get homozygous lines, and here's a heterozygous line. So we see that it's fairly close to the wild type levels, but in the mutant, homozygous mutant, we see a significant reduction in the levels of these particular isoflavones. We're continuing with this work trying to find other alleles we can knock out. And the question is, now that you don't have this, where do these guys go to next? And hopefully with Dr. Jack Goodman's help, we can start doing a little characterizing and see what goes that way or that way, or just can't go down that way. And also use these guys to, you know, see you know, now you don't have biocannon A using it as a control for those with biocannon A. <laughs> so this is the zinc finger, the ZFT, which is the RSD again, just showing that there's no expression in the negative or nod minus plants. And so we're trying to knock this gene out along with some of the other um, zinc finger proteins that are not expressed. Okay, <clears throat> so that's kind of the direction we're going on the red clover, some of the molecular work we're interested in doing. I uh, spent most of my time looking at the health estuary to fight symbiosis. Again, this was our first task, and of course, uh, Dr. Klotz already kind of talked a little bit about why we're interested in this. Uh, again, primarily because the endophyte appears to provide some kind of abiotic as well as biotic protection. <clears throat> And again, the alkaloid production and some of the different uh, phenotypes that have been associated with the presence of the endophyte. And at the molecular level, how is this communication happening? That's what I've been interested in looking at. So, in order to do that, I've talked about this before, we generated some clone pairs. So, this is the same genotype. We used a fungicide and got. Uh, plants with and without the endophyte, <clears throat> planted these in the field, as well as in Dr. McCulley's uh, climate change uh, plots. And from one experiment, we're looking at stress, looking at pillaring, and for example, clone P27, clone 27, CTE plus or CTE minus, which is the unstressed, uh, and following stress, we see that there is a recovery after 30 days. There is a significant difference here between the E plus and the E minus and the E plus. So this particular clone appears to uh, respond to the presence of the endophyte under stress. So this was done with several different clones. And this one here, again, was the one that really showed the differential expression E plus, E minus recovery under stress. Uh, clone 46 showed that it was stressed, but the endophyte didn't have any effect. And that was basically the same thing what we found here with some of the non-toxic endophyte strains that we used out in the field as well. One of the good things about using this particular RNA-seq method is that you can also uh, take a look to see the, how many uh, reads you have in the endophyte. And so here, this is your average percent to the endophyte itself in these particular tissues. So you get about one to three percent in the infected. Um, and you can use those numbers to take a look 
at gene expression in the endophyte. So again, this is the genes that are involved in the um, synthesis, biosynthesis of the uh, ergot alkaloids in the endophyte, uh, starting with GMAW, going all the way through to the production of lysergic acid, and then following to ergovaline and some of the ergot, other ergots. And you can follow the expression in the endophyte all the way through. Um, so that's been kind of a handy, uh, just having this particular technology to use. Um, in this particular experiment, the effect of the stress on the endophyte expression was basically, it changed this way and that way, but there was no particular, there was no effect of the stress on gene expression in the endophyte that we could actually say, oh, here's the endophyte that's being producing this particular alkaloid or not producing this alkaloid because of the stress. Looking at gene expression, um, so we see that, we see that the effect of the stress is significant. Uh, so these are the unstressed and these are the stressed, but we see the E plus versus the E minus, they're falling in the same group. So there's really no effect or didn't appear to be effect of the endophyte on the, um, in response to the stress, which was not what I wanted to see. And we looked at differential expression of these genes, again, across the different clones, P27, 46, P15, and 12. Basically, there were some differential expression compared to the E minus and the E plus, and E plus to the E minus, but they were all clone specific, and none of them were basically across all the different clones. So there, I cannot say there's a particular gene or group of genes that are involved in stress response by the presence of the endophyte. So that was not what I wanted to see, but that's what's called research. Um, there is, we did see that there was some general types of patterns, even though they weren't significant by using the, you know, we're using the FDR 0.5% significance and twofold difference. There were some that kind of followed general pattern. Uh, so in the gene ontology cat category, um, catabolic toxic process are involved with um, dealing with different pathogens or fungi. There did appear to be a general type of pattern of expression. Again, these guys over here, P46 and P12, were not significant and were not as affected by the presence of the endophyte. Um, the same thing here in response to chitin, again, because of the endophyte. These two here appear to be similarly typed in terms of the expression patterns, but not significant. So that's a place sort of to start. Maybe if we lower our significance value or differential expression, we might find some pathways that might be significant, but using this standard two-fold difference, P0.05, it's not what we want to see. One of the genes that has consistently is what's called the working transcription factor, and it's always in the E plus greater than the E, sorry, E minus greater than E plus in the control condition, and it's always significantly um, showing differential expression. These working transcription factors are affected by stress. And so as you see, this stress response for this particular working, it always goes up. So these are not significant just because of the differential expression. But these transcription factors always tend to show, at least these working ones, tend to show that they're suppressed in the E plus plant. Um, and these transcription factors are involved in basically interaction with uh, fungi or different uh, biotic stressors. So it seems like the presence, sorry, abiotic stress. So it appears that these fungi tend to suppress these genes in uh, health issues. So it, maybe it's already being primed for stress. That's what we can say so far. We're trying to figure out what this really means still, as well as some of the other genes that we saw that were 
kind of following the same patterns, but still in terms of saying this is here are the pathways and these are it, um, we still have a ways to go. So we're time limited, time ended. I'll try to if there are any questions or if you have any time. Oh, uh, my question. <laughs> well, there's two, two principal questions. And the first is when, when the new building. When's the new building? Back. Uh, I think that's it's above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> he recently added, said that was coming back, I believe. So I whether or not anyone believes it, um, we will see that. Uh, possibility it's at least raise its head again for the first time in five years or something. Well, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was one question. Is this um this how how do I uh what's the code that is going uh the space presentation is that something that is uh maybe the uh, bovine body that is just uh, turned on by consumption, or does the animal have to eat that infected material over a longer time range to show these symptoms? I'm not sure what the time is. I think it's more time as well as the concentration uh, in terms of showing oxygen levels. Uh, we see just going out pastures. In the summertime, a lot of cattle are sitting in the shade under trees or they're in the water. And that's basically the response to having eaten. In all probability, in Kentucky, having eaten food by infected bacteria. And is the infested meat of those animals, is that uh, still, uh, uh, still possible for humans to consume it or is it taken from the market? That one, in terms of once it goes from the animal into the grocery store, I am not privy to how what the levels are at that level. Well, I don't, I don't think it's ever been detected in the jacket. So if you've ever detected some oxygen, or the rail, and also the Yeah, and they usually, you know, before they in the feedlot, they take them off of the fish and they come to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
and the gold standard would be changing the genetics of the plant, then you don't have toxin anymore. You can change the genetics of the animal so that they're resistant. You can't do that. You can change the physiology of the animal, which we do with isoplasm. Or you can change the physiology of the plant, like seed head suppression, or if they blended with seed head suppression. If so, have you done any pasture surveys for your fungus, for your pathogen? On um, Have you looked, I mean, you said you had a hard time getting it to work for you. <laughs> have you looked outside in nature? Do you regularly see sea uh, lesions? Um, I haven't done surveys. What I've done is I've taken over from the pastures um, or caves from people who notice slobbery in their livestock. So Jack Whitman comes and provides me with some clover after he observed the course of slobbery. And I was able to isolate um, the fungus out of that. And Ray provides me with clover from a producer in Morgan County whose cattle were slobbery. So I was able to isolate the fungus out of that. And use the PCR method to determine that I really did have what I thought it was because I know that it's supposed to be black and fuzzy, but it helps to have a DNA test to back that up. And I have not tried going out in the field and just doing a survey of theirs. I guess that's a method that I rarely talk to a horse owner who hasn't observed that in their in their own animals and know about it in somebody else. So we know it's quite prevalent that they actually go up find a little plant. That's another question. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction like uh, um, that uh, urine is the source of nitrate leaching. Uh, has it really been investigated that uh, that is a substantial source of Nitrate leaching? Yes, the Texas A&M has modeled it actually. And uh, of course, it depends on the situation. Like I said, on one, one pasture, you know, we're both of these. You know, if you're going to be redistributing the nutrients over the pasture, you're going to be all right. But in more intensive operations, like in a feed lot, of course, they're not going to have any vegetative matter or if they dare to eat the concrete, you know, all the manure and all the urine, you know, can take them off of the skitter and then it becomes a, a waste management problem. But so very, very much depends on the situation. Um, yeah, yeah, the reason that she's modeled it actually in use of uh, modeling the effects of uh, the finesse in our vegetable we saw that biotic. It's just shown the kind of improvements you can get, uh, both in methane use and in nitrogen release. I understand that in, in food dogs, they you have really a concentration uh, that may be a problem, but that's also the place where it can be skimmed off, where it can be, be collected and controlled. But in the pasture system, uh, has, has there been really done lots of research on it? Everybody believes if, if, if there's a little heat done and uh, or, or a, a cow urinate, oh my goodness, looking. But uh, is it really that dark of an amount? And we uh, have to, to appreciate also that after what's the vegetation is different. So, Raising animals cause a lot of heterogeneity in the subsequent growth. And I think that takes care of it itself. Yeah. But nonetheless, you're not getting the nitrogen in the animal, and the product is in itself. So you can, you can have that weight of the animal and put it back in the pasture. Either way, from an environmental footprint, I think we've got it on pasture right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. There has been a fair amount done on urine hot spots, and you know, I don't know that everybody is. Fairly nitrate loss, but it is definitely a whole lot of nitrate loss. Anyway, it's in one spot. It doesn't take a lot of pathways for a loss. All right, we're running late, you guys. Let's thank them all. <laughs>